distracting. Um, so welcome, good morning everybody. Thank you all for turning out uh, and coming out for equality today. So my name is Dr. DeVries Jordan and I am an assistant professor of political science and also one of the co-advisors of the LGBTS Alliance. This is our fifth coming out for equality convocation and we do this in support of diverse campus community as well as the National Coming Out Day. Uh, today we celebrate people coming out as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, intersex, asexual, gender queer, gender fluid, gender diverse, gender non-conforming, and the list goes on. Uh, and and I, think that, I just want to note that I'm using language here to um, show that this is not uh, limited to a certain set of fixed categories, that, that not everybody necessarily feels they fit in those categories, and part of coming out for quality, I think, means using language that's inclusive and showing that we respect the fact that um, not everybody necessarily feels they feel they fit in certain boxes and uh, embracing that. Um, today also is a day to celebrate people coming out as allies, and there's lots of things you can do to you know, come out as allies every day. I was thinking about this on the way over here. You know, just listening to someone and being supportive can be a great coming out kind of experience. Um, even respecting someone's wishes to use the name that they prefer to be called and the pronouns, the gender pronouns that they prefer to have used. That is an important step in coming out for equality. Uh, and these are things that you can do every day on this campus and really have a huge effect for other people in terms of feeling welcome and uh, appreciated in the environment we are in. Uh, we have an exciting lineup for today. Uh, Dr. James Salvo, uh, Assistant Professor of Speech at the University of Pittsburgh at Bradford, is going to start us off. And then we have Reverend Rob Cloud, who is the co-pastor at Bradford's First Presbyterian Church, who will speak next. Uh, then we've got student Jalen Burroughs, who is the Secretary of the LGBF, LGBTS Alliance. Uh, and then we'll finish with Dr. Ron Binder, who is the Associate Dean of Student Affairs and my co-advisor for the LGBTS Alliance. So we've got a whole round of speakers. Uh, and then we're going to follow that up with a march to the Panther statue and, um, you know, taking some pictures and just nice to get on social media some um, nice colorful rainbow support for, for quality. Um, we have a lot to celebrate this year, uh, especially with the U.S. Supreme Court decision that led to the extension of marriage equality uh, or whole around the country, you know, not just in certain states. Um, and it's important to realize, though, that we also have some important policy changes that are still needed today whether it's regarding hate crimes, gender recognition, and also uh, protection against discrimination based on sexual orientation, gender identity. I wanted to briefly mention that since the Supreme Court decision, the Equality Act has been introduced by Senators Jeff Merkley, Tammy Baldwin, and Cory Booker, as well as Representatives David Sicilian and John Lewis. Uh, and this legislation, if passed, right, if passed, would establish explicit permanent protections against discrimination based on an individual's sexual orientation or gender identity in matters of employment, housing, access to public places, federal funding, credit, education, and jury service. Uh, in addition, it would prohibit discrimination on the basis of sex and federal funding and access to public places. This is a really big deal. Um, and it's a big improvement on some of the earlier legislation that had actually been proposed. Um, however, in order to pass it, a lot more members of Congress need to get on board and supporting it. So if there's personal interest in this, I encourage you to get involved. There's a huge need for lobbying and grassroots mobilization. Now, contact your members, uh, your local members of Congress, and let them know you support this issue, and, and uh, make it very personal. Uh, I, I also want to take a moment today just to reflect on coming out. There are many ways of coming out about our identity and our support for LGBT rights. And there's no right way or time to come out. Uh, it's a highly personal decision, and it's important that we gauge which environments are most likely to be supportive of us when we do come out. Sometimes we're with some people or in some environments in which we choose not to come out, and that's okay. Um, and it's important to sort of realize that you don't out someone else, too, because they may not be out in all environments. Um, you know, it really give them the privilege of, of choosing in which environments they want to out themselves, I guess. Um, I also want to emphasize that coming out has many benefits. On a personal level, I can tell you for me at least, you know, coming out means being true to my identity and values, um, celebrating who you are, being acknowledged for who you are, and, and having the person you love most dearly be acknowledged for who they are in your life, and not need to worry constantly about outing yourself or being selective about what you reveal about yourself. You know, when you are in the closet in one way, you find yourself so many ways trying to be closeted because you're always worried about how that might affect the way people see you. 
Um, so personally, it's, it's very, um, a very, very gratifying experience. Sometimes it can be also challenging, you know. Um, but I've also found in studying the marriage equality movement, which is what my research is on, um, that coming out is also essential to create political change. In the countries and states in which marriage equality has been won via the referendum or ballot initiative, it's only because of historic grassroots mobilization of people going on the ground, sharing their personal stories, sharing the ways it's impacted themselves, their family members, their friends, uh, and having detailed conversations in which people sort of get exposure to this and, and, and sort of relate to it, make it make politics personal, that that has been really key in getting the votes that were needed to win these ballot initiatives and referendums. Um, in legislation that has been passed. The only reason that was passed is because, um, especially in particular, because allies as well as LGBT individuals went to lobby legislators and shared their personal narratives and made it personal to the legislators. Also because we had out LGBT legislators in different countries, uh, as well as allies who were legislators who shepherded that legislation. And in that way, they also came out and supported this issue. Uh, and then finally, in the countries in which it was won through, um, in, as in the case in the United States, through the Supreme Court, it's only because people were willing to make themselves vulnerable and share their personal stories and that of their families that really made this an issue that people could relate with. You know, in the case of Michigan, the plaintiffs in that case they talked about their family and these four children that they were trying to adopt and how it affected them not to have both parents recognized. And it wasn't a case about marriage equality, it was about their family, but they made their family vulnerable and they shared their story and that had a profound impact around the country. Um, so coming out also in many ways is also, I think, um, political and um, that's how society also evolves and changes. And, um, you know, the small things that we do in coming out in support of equality in this campus make this campus the inclusive environment it is, but it also has long-standing effects. Um, and sometimes we don't even realize it as we're interacting with each other on a day-to-day -day basis. As an out faculty member who does research on transnational activism concerning <coughs> LGBT rights, I have received incredible support across the board from my colleagues, from my students, and it makes me able to like really focus on what I'm doing and be passionate about it and feel safe in doing so. And that's not the case still in a lot of university contexts. It's changing dramatically, but it's, it's still very much in progress. I'm very grateful, actually, for that. Um, we're very fortunate to live in a political climate in which this is possible, but much more progress is needed. Um, just this week, you know, unfortunately, another transgender individual, uh, you know, was, was killed. And we do not have enough protections uh, in place to, to really uh, allow um, special hate crimes, for example, to be prosecuted. So there, there is much need for policy improvement here as well as abroad. Um, the bright colors we're all wearing today, I think, is a, a show of our solidarity with both um, our campus community, our local community, the global community, of our alliance and solidarity with LGBTQ people. And um, again, please feel free to take a rainbow at the end and come with us to the March this year. We're going to take some pictures, um, and, and it'll be a fun event. Um, and again, I encourage you, in, in, in even in small ways, to find out ways in which you can come out to support equality um, in, in ways that are meaningful to other people on this campus. Uh, and so without further ado, uh, Dr. Salvo. So thank you to the uh, LGBTQ uh, Alliance for having me. Thank you to uh, Dr. DeVries Jordan for inviting me to speak. I appreciate that. Um, all right. Labor Day is a funny holiday. It's the only holiday we celebrate by avoiding the object of celebration. In other words, Labor Day is essentially the day when we say, let's celebrate work by not doing it. <laughs> Uh, that tells us something. In general, work is something that's imposed upon us. And though we may like what we do, the very fact that it be imposed anyway, that we're expected to work in order to be a productive member of society, tends to diminish the enjoyment. The celebration of Labor Day, then, lies in the alleviation of the imposition. And isn't identity funny in this way also? Think about people with privileged identities. Those identities are ones that are socially invisible. For instance, I'm bad with names, very bad. Um, once someone was trying to convince me to watch, speaking of identity, Identity Thief, um, they said, James, you'll probably like it. It's hilarious, and it has Eric Stone Street in it, and his barb is super funny. 
Uh, and I was like, Who, who's Eric Stone Street again? And my friend was like, he's one of the gay dads on Modern Family. See, gay is an identity, as is straight, but gay is an identifier, and straight isn't. For example, who's Dwayne Johnson? Oh, he's a straight guy in Furious 7. We don't say stuff like that. It's a privilege to have an invisible identity because you're not constrained to think about it every time someone brings it up. And see, they never bring it up. In other words, it isn't imposed upon you and you're probably thinking about something else. So it's really weird to hear people say stuff like, Stephen, my gay friend, said he got his flu shot today. We should probably go get ours. Is being gay the only thing we think of when we think of Stephen? That's very reductive, but we hear people say stuff like this all the time. This is on my iPhone. Um, and that's why sexual identities are funny to me, too. At a very generous estimate, we have sex for, let's say, an hour a day. But I'm on Facebook for like three times longer than that. If identity is based on what we do, then shouldn't I be a Facebooker more than whatever identity it is that I have based upon whatever kind of sex I'm having? And true, one could say that sexual identity is based more upon who we choose as sexual partners, but who we choose as sexual partners isn't based solely upon genitalia. What if you can only date tall people because you find short people to be unattractive? I'm five, seven. Um, <laughs> why isn't it that that why isn't that included in sexual identity? What if you, at all costs, avoid dating mean people? Then that, too. Uh, all this means just as much in terms of partner choice. Um, further, what if one is monogamous? Wouldn't the partner of Stephen, the guy who got the flea shot, just be a Stephenosexual? I mean, look. In general, why are we so obsessed with genitals in the first place? It's strange. If you think about it, every time you have to refer to someone in the third person, you have to make a quick guess about what type of genitals they have. Just think about that for a moment. It's freaking weird because really, that's all that he or she actually means. This person with a particular type of genitals. So to translate, Stephen said that one who has a penis got one who has a penis's flu shot today, and we, who are of undetermined genitalia, should get ours. It's so freaking weird. <laughs> So, this is our day of celebration. We celebrate accomplishments. We've been put upon, marginalized, and we've overcome social obstacles and stigmas placed on us because of our identities. We should be proud of that. But the identities themselves aren't the accomplishments. They're simply identities, and it's weird to be proud of something that isn't an accomplishment. To be happy that, again, on my iPhone, tap, tap. Uh, to be happy that we've politically come to a point where we no longer have to feel stigmatized isn't quite the same thing as being prideful. We're celebrating because we've been that much further removed from an economy of shame and hiding. So our day of pride doesn't necessarily mean we have to be so identified with our identity to be celebratory. We're complex individuals, all of us, and we're much more than someone reducible to the genitals of the person or persons we date. Uh, so, like Labor Day, the day when we celebrate work by not working, might it be worth considering celebrating our identities by distancing ourselves from them, claiming the same privilege that straight people have, acknowledging that the reward for overcoming what we have is that other people need to start thinking of us uh, as more than people who have a certain kind of sex or persons with certain types of genitals. Thanks.
1988, there was a conference in Minnesota that created so much stir and so much controversy that the Presbyterian Church went from 3 million people to 1.8 million people in one year. And the reason was, the name of this conference was Reimagining God. Reimagining God in the image of all people. And recognizing that Sophia, a word in the Greek which means wisdom, also represents God in all of her forms. It created so much dissidence between members of the church that people couldn't come to coexist with one another. In 1988, friends, I was in middle school. <laughs> and it formed who I was as I went through high school and undergraduate like you and drove me to find opportunities in graduate school to learn as much as I possibly could to be able to understand the full inclusion of all God's people. Words are funny, and actually, uh, Dr. stole some of my own speech too, uh, and I'm not even going to try to tap the iPhone at this point. Words are funny, and when we go from either Hebrew to English or Greek to English or a dead language like Aramaic to English, it's almost impossible for us to be able to get the full identity of a word and understand what undergirds it. I would need a senior seminar, which isn't a bad idea, Dr. Evans, uh, to be able to go through the entire Bible and go through how it has been misrepresented over the years in ways that those words were then taken out of context and created harm and pain to so many people. In the last few years, there has been probably earth-shattering change, not only in the political spectrum, as you were talking about earlier, but in how the church understands its role in the lives of all people. Marriage equality was something that I honestly tell, can tell you right now that in 1992, I never thought that I would be standing before you saying not only was I invited to this event, but that I would be standing before you as a co-pastor of a church that had a wedding this year in McKean County, in Bradford, in a church between two loving individuals. And that those two individuals could stand there and say the same words that anyone else would say, professing a covenantal bond between one another, and that it would be one that is held in the idea, not of the state, but held in the idea of God and how they understand their God's love for them. When I was an undergrad, I had the opportunity to meet a man named Mel White. Some of you will know him as the author of Strangers at the Gate. He was a ghostwriter for Reverend Dr. Billy Graham. Mel White came out several years before that book that he wrote, but that book was a seminal work in the beginning of what they call the Metropolitan Church that started in and around Texas and has grown all over the country as the very first inclusive church that was ever founded for the purpose of making sure that people had a place to worship where they were loved for who they were. It took a long time for other parts of the church to catch up. When asked about Dr. Graham's feelings on it, Mel White hedges and says there's an awful lot of people that write for Dr. Graham. But know that Dr. Graham's love for someone who basically was an adopted daughter. You'll know her as a great mystery author, Patricia Cornwell, who grew up in Montreal and in his house. That he and his wife loved her as a daughter, and when she came out, nothing changed between them. Read between the lines about where others may say they fall, but where their real feelings are. Unfortunately, the church has done that far too much. As we stand before you today, we recognize that to many, I'll, be, I'll wear this with a badge of honor, I am a heretic, I am an apostate, I am someone who stands in the breach of what they call the office of minister of word and sacrament, and I have done great harm to the flock. 
I would say to them, no, I have stood for what Jesus stood for, which was to love your neighbor with all your heart, your mind, and your soul. We're given two, two actual things to go out and do. Love God with all your heart, your mind, and your soul, and your neighbor as yourself. For too long, the church has ignored those two and focused on 580 other laws that start at the beginning of the book and end at the end of the book. And they haven't changed a thing. They say the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. The church's job is to make sure that all feel loved. The very first things in Genesis is to remind you of, in that book, you are made in the image of God, no matter who you are, no matter where you find yourself today or how you may identify yourself today, you are made in the image of God. I didn't know if I would end this way, and I don't have the political clout of Pope Francis. I don't even have the breadth of the body of Christ. I'm a progressive, radical Christian that's called Presbyterian, but on behalf of that group, as a white male, a person of privilege, a straight person who has recognized the harm that I have done to the community of faith, I apologize on behalf of the institutional church. And I ask your forgiveness and the chance to make it right by journeying with you from this day forward. Thank you.
I believe that events like this are just what we need um, to create a world where LGBTQ plus people don't have to live here. I encourage everyone to take a look at your vocabulary and behaviors and think about whether or not they are encouraging or discouraging progress. Just being here at this event today shows that you're willing to take the steps needed to achieve a safe and comfortable world for LGBTQ plus people and their allies. If allies and members of the community speak out loudly and display their pride right openly, I know that our dreams of equality are not too far out of reach. Thank you. Uh, by the way, I'm Ron Bender, Associate Dean of Students, and I'm very happy to also be the co-advisor to LGBTS, uh, a great group of students who get a chance to interact with them. I think you'd be very pleased with a lot of our students here and the passion that they have for this issue. And particularly, uh, I'll call a big shout out to uh, Tyler, who's been the president for three years now. So Tyler, thank you for your service. <laughs> To it without support, and uh, the one people that are always here when Tyler comes out to events are his parents. Would his parents please stand? We'll see how we get <laughs> In many ways, you've been a role model for a lot of parents across the campus and across the country for your unconditional love and support of Tyler. One of my favorite phrases is the world is run by those who show up. <laughs> As someone once said, uh, you've shown up today, which means you walked, you voted with your feet. With America, we like to vote with our feet, and you showed up. I remember sitting on a plane recently, and uh, I think it was Delta Airlines said, uh, we thank you for flying Delta. We know you have a lot of choices in life as the airlines. We appreciate you being with us. You had a lot of choices at where to be today at 11.30. We appreciate you showing up and spending it with us. We hope it's been a good, productive day for you. A couple things that I would say is kind of uh, concluding. Uh, as someone said, this has been a good year for, I think, LGBT rights in this country. We've made a lot of progress with here, not only just the Supreme Court rulings, which I think surprised even folks in the LGBT community as far as the Supreme Court went. And uh, as I'm always reminded of my political science folks, they said, well, uh, what does a 5-4, I think it was a 5-4 vote? I said, what does a 5-4 vote mean? It means it's the law of the land. <laughs> We'd love it to be uh, uh, unanimous, but I'll take a 5-4 vote affirming people's rights. And so for that, we're very grateful for that, and I think the LGBT community across the country. I can remember seeing the Facebook postings of people saying, I wish that U.S., right before they announced the decision, I wish the U.S. would be in line with many other countries, and I believe we are getting there, if not already there. It was very gratifying to see, for those of you who have friends on Facebook, to see the HRC symbol, Human Rights Campaign, red thing on there. It was great to see, as Jalen pointed out, uh, if we're going to make progress in the LGBT area, it's going to be the enlistment of our allies. And I know this summer I did some programs with my fraternity, which is one of the largest fraternities in the country. 1,500 men gathered uh, in Nashville, and I was able to present 200 of them on safe zone training. And uh, very nice is that we're very supportive by that, but one thing I said was, can we please make sure the 100 are the allies in the room so that we can spread the message about equality uh, for all of our student organizations. It's also been a really good year um, in terms of our religious uh, uh, groups. Uh, we've seen more progress with mainline uh, Christian groups, particularly in this country, than we've ever seen before. Uh, obviously, the Presbyterian Church voted last year to allow same-sex marriage to occur. Uh, we know that the Methodists are not far behind, and so they're coming up. We also know some other groups have been in our corner for many, many years, and we think that's going to continue with that. Uh, we know we've had some more uh, legal protections. It's one thing we're going to make progress, as Helen would point out politically, it's not only do we have marriage equality, but now it's job protection. We need to make sure those people who decide to come out don't actually lose their positions. And unfortunately, we've seen a few of those happen across the country. We hope that doesn't occur anymore, uh, but that's certainly something we need about that. And it goes like that we want people to practice their religious religion, but we also want to make sure there's some protections there. But also, it's a really good year because I got married. <laughs> Some people may know this, but uh, the reason uh, uh, Rob said about the marriage was actually my marriage. Yeah. And uh, the Presbyterian Church voted, and I was very happy 
uh, that the church that uh, my husband and I, which is still hard to say the word husband. <laughs> but anyways, um, by the way, Tyler, he said that he wants to see the, the, the recording of this, so he wants to see this. So. Um, but anyways, to be, able to, sit, to be able to go in front of the church and get married, a church that we've spent a lot of time with, a church that I have devoted uh, at least six years of my time with, uh, singing in the choir and everything like that. Uh, of course, this joke wouldn't be a church choir without some gay man singing. <laughs> so uh, we are uh, very happy that the church affirmed this. And not only I appreciate this, that the church voted not only to affirm the marriage for Morgan and I, but also affirmed it for any same-sex couple in the future. Who knew little old Bradford? Who knew little old Brad from McKean County, 2,000 feet up in the air of the mountains, uh, in a rural area, uh, would be one of the first in the area, and I believe the first in the Presbytery, in our Presbytery. Uh, to do this and everything like that. So we appreciate the leadership, not only of the church, the elders and everything, but also of our pastors. And I believe their comment was, this affirmed our decision to come here three years ago. And it also affirmed our decision as elders to have them as our pastors. So this has been a good year. We still have some ways to go. We still have some job protection things we need to invoke across the country. Uh, we need to make sure that, that happens. And uh, we need to make it so that people can practice their religion, but also have our liberties. Um, one thing I would point out as the advisor here is a number of upcoming events. And we're very proud of the LGBTS Alliance. It's been around here for a number of years. I think Dean Evans, when was the first, I'm not sure the spot, when was the first LGBT who wasn't called LGBTS? No, it had a different name, but it had to be in the, the late 80s or early 90s. Late 80s, early 90s. And in some ways, as we talk to our counterparts in Oakland, not to pick on them, but as they will tell us that we are probably a couple steps ahead of where they are in terms of what we're doing here and everything. So I, it's something I get to brag about a lot. Everybody on Facebook to my friends is how progressive I think we are. Can we do some good stuff? This fall, we've had a very, very busy LGBTS thing. First of all, we've, uh, this is the, I think, third year, Tyler. We've had the Ice Cream Social. It's the third year. Uh, where the first week of falling to fun activities, we set the tone by inviting the campus to come to Ice Cream Social. We make sure we had enough ice cream this year. <laughs> um, in uh, housing, uh, Res Life, we put on our, uh, our annual uh, program on uh, sex sex education, we call it Sex Fest 2015, and LGBTS is very good about showing up to those events and having literature, which you can see on the table there. They also were a club night where they had a lot of student interest with that, which we were appreciative of. Um, we had our first, last Saturday, our first alumni and family reception as part of alumni and family weekend, and that was a first for Pitt Bradford. As we said to the groups gathered there, we had a nice little small gathering, which we know will grow. We said the greatest benefit was the fact that it listed on the program that went out to 10,000 Pitt Bradford alumni was this thing called LGBTS reception, which I'm sure we have to explain to a lot of people what that is, but at least a lot of people knew that we were being very progressive as a, as a university. Um, we have a lot of things. We have a mental health speaker coming up. We're going to talk about that with bullying. We're going to talk about that. We're going to have our movie night again. We're going to provide our safe zone training uh, this semester. We're also going to have our first ever transgender day of remembrance. We're going to talk about transgender issues, which sometimes, unfortunately, gets overlooked in the LGBT. Sometimes we don't talk about that nearly as much. And then we also were present out at the uh, FC McKean County Prison uh, on the first diversity day. We were there. So we were there at the prison talking to the staff about that. And then finally, we're going to have another what we call our prayer chat where we're going to pick a topic and invite anybody from the community to come out and speak. It's a very long list of activities. I'm very grateful for LGBTS. The students do a very good job, put in a lot of time, and we're very, very grateful for that. Well, as I said before, you have a lot of ways of spending your time here, and uh, we appreciate you coming and spending time with us today. It means a lot uh, to the LGBT community, knowing that not only we have folks that are willing to come out, we also have allies that are supporting us. And so what we'd like to do now uh, to kind of commemorate this is we happen to have our tall, furry friend in the back, Panther. <laughs> Mr. Panther would like to have a picture taken. Um, at the outside of the chapel, uh, right down at the very thing where the ramp goes down. We'd like to get a quick picture of everybody there, and then we're going to march over to the pantry, and uh, we'd like to take another picture over there at the pantry, uh, and to put that up in our publications uh, to show the campus not only that we're very friendly, but for any incoming students or students' parents uh, to know that we are a very welcoming community. We appreciate so much everyone being here. It means a lot to the LGBT community, and uh, again, we thank you for spending our time so, if we could go out there, uh, there's also a banner there. If you have not seen that, please do that. We gather outside at the bottom of the chapel steps. We live. 